a CRG series in the Corona Times. Six lectures on migrants and refugees. In collaboration with Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, South Asia, and Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna. The COVID-19 pandemic has ushered in an era which even without it appeared as building on its inheritance of displacement, discrimination and disparity. Yet, ours is also an era which inherited the idea that empathy isn't alien to law, politics or to any field of knowledge or activity. That in certain luminous moments, hope and history rhyme. The unprecedented scale of forced displacement, its growing catalysts and the distress darkening it present immediate challenges for migrants and marginalized people all over the world. The six lectures in this series by Calcutta Research Group explore the conditions of migrants in the present day. They investigate issues of protection, vulnerability, neoliberalism, statelessness, international law and ethics. Lecture 4. Statelessness with emphasis on de facto statelessness and the rightlessness of sections of population. The speaker is K. M. Parivelan from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. The possession of a nationality is a fundamental human right. Situations of statelessness, de jure or de facto, violate this right, creating a near total absence of protection, rights and formal identity. While statelessness on the whole has several complex and historical catalysts, the irony of in situ statelessness is all too often the result of nationality laws which do not stand the test of modern notions of justice. Formally welcoming all to this module on statelessness. As we all know, uh, statelessness uh, as a term phenomenon, some of us will be familiar, those who are working in uh, the field of uh, post-migration, displacement uh, uh, studies and discourses. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to start uh, with what is statelessness? In a way, we all know that it is interconnected with uh, a denial of rights, citizenship, or even denial of nationality. Uh, it is also of, often clubbed with uh, the issue of uh, uh, refugees. Uh, and sometimes we even use the word, uh, uh, you know, stateless refugees. So let me start with the terminologies. We all are very familiar with the term refugee, somebody who is uh, uh, persecuted uh, on, on the five grounds as per the 1951 convention uh, on the status of refugees. Somebody persecuted and it, uh, they cross the international border, seek asylum in another country. And we know that internally displaced persons is a terminology where somebody is affected, uh, uh, displaced, but within a nation state border, so within a country. An asylum seeking is a process where it could be a refugee seeking an asylum or, or, or other reasons that they, they formally come through the channel and reach out. But yet this term statelessness is quite, uh, uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, enigmatic where somebody who is denied of their nationality by law, uh, that's what the 1954 Convention on Statelessness uh, defines it. Uh, but how do we identify somebody is denied of nationality? How do they get recognized? The question here is that invisibility is one of the biggest uh, challenges. You will keep this in mind. We also would have as a part of outline, uh, looking at uh, how the South Asian history, culture, colonial experience had played an important role uh, in uh, addressing the uh, citizenship and uh, statelessness continuum migration, state succession, citizenship uh, uh, recognition uh, procedures, birth registration, these all become uh, some of the important uh, issues which we need to 
grapple with. As a part of this presentation framework, we will look at some of the theoretical and conceptual framework of statelessness by looking at some of the examples as we would know. In the South and Southeast Asia, in an interconnected way, we have a group named Rohingyas who uh, are formerly from uh, the present day uh, Myanmar who are denied of their citizenship rights and therefore being a highly persecuted group. They, they flee and, and they seek asylum they, in a formal or informal way and they also become stateless refugees. So today we have in a contemporary setting uh, a, a very uh, uh, pertinent example. We have had otherwise Chakmas, Urdu speaking Biharis, emanated from India during partition, moved into Bangladesh. For quite some time, they were uh, denied of their uh, citizenship uh, recognition, lingered as stateless people, uh, but with the, uh, the intervention of the uh, Supreme Court of Bangladesh, now they are getting formally recognized as citizens. Similarly, uh, back in India, we have uh, the West Pakistan refugees, for example, for a long time, lived a life of uh, de facto condition of uh, stateless. Because again, they, they are victims of uh, partition. When they came in and entered the, 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 the Jammu and Kashmir, and because of uh, certain laws which prevailed in Jammu and Kashmir uh, on recognizing permanent residents, these people, how much ever, were recognized by the union government, but could not uh, get uh, their due uh, citizenship recognition uh, in this uh, entanglement between the center and state relation with the Jain, Jammu, former Jammu and Kashmir having a special status, uh, you know, they were denied of their uh, full uh, citizenship. Food. And now probably with the recent uh, state reorganization, scrapping of Article 370 and Article 35A, uh, how much of it is very contentious and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether it is in a due process, but probably this also uh, in the dark clouds provide a silver lining process where probably this West Pakistan refugee issue may get sorted out. And through the news, we are hearing that they are getting recognized as uh, from citizens who may enjoy the full rights. So these are all in a, a few examples. Even I could add, uh, you know, within the Sri Lankan refugees. There are a category of Indian origin people uh, who are called as uh, hill country Tamils. Uh, probably their issue of in Sri Lanka, whether they got full citizenship, uh, whether in India, when they mingled and came along with refugees, uh, they were bracketed as largely refugees and kept in the refugee camp. They kept appealing that uh, they, uh, they would like to be recognized being Indian origin people, that they would be recognized as uh, citizens. I think that issue uh, still continues. So these are all there, you see, uh, uh, which are uh, deeply embedded in uh, the, the colonial history, uh, the labor migration, and so on and so forth. And also, uh, you know, we are also in a time uh, where uh, the COVID pandemic has, uh, you know, brought in a huge paradigm shift uh, in, 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 in number of uh, arena of quality, society, economy, labor. And that is actually also compounding this issue uh, in the contemporary times, which, which we may uh, like to contextualize and see as well. So broadly, uh, uh, the statelessness, uh, you know, uh, could be classified as a de jure statelessness, that is by law. Uh, legally, in an official sense, somebody is stateless. The other is the de facto statelessness. That is in a practical sense that they don't enjoy uh, the, the, the rights, the citizenship rights. So that could also be seen. Today we are also looking at how the rightlessness of section of population who are vulnerable and marginalized during the COVID pandemic is also a context uh, we, we may have to look at how many, uh, how people are uh, facing the, the de facto conditions of statelessness where they don't uh, enjoy the rights as citizens and avail uh, some of the uh, relief uh, and remedies uh, which may be otherwise available. Uh, this model also uh, can focus on the issues of uh, National Register of Citizens called the acronym as NRC and the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, issues and the challenges faced 
and and we know how uh, that has compounded the covid has compounded these ongoing debates which were happening in the last one or two years starting from the nrc in assam and the announcement of it and uh, the announcement of uh, citizenship amendment act which came in and uh, and there were quite a series of uh, debates on this issue so i think that is something very important because uh, the nrc exclusion of earlier 40 lakh people and later 19 lakh uh, people uh, rendered as uh, non citizens and what happens to them the covid i think it is again uh, created a lot of pressure because there is no process there is no appeal there is no other remedy available for them. so we may have to you know, look at these examples so we look at how statelessness as a denial of citizenship and citizenship with the very rights given or seemingly interconnected and the look as a continuum uh, that has to be seen from uh, not just from the national context but also from the south asian context coming back to the definition of what is statelessness the unhcr officially estimates that there are nearly about 10 million people who are rendered as stateless worldwide when you go deeply into the statistics they have for about 5.6 million people uh, recorded uh, information from the data collected from various uh, countries so it, it 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 could be anywhere from 5.6 to 10 million people uh, it is uh, stateless are the ones who are considered are uh, not considered uh, rather as nationals by any state under the operation of its law that's an official definition uh, it is sometimes referred to the invisible population uh, the marginalized invisible population because stateless people often remain unseen and unheard that's something very challenging that how do we really identify them map them and understand uh, their plight they do not get access to education or health care or livelihood or shelter and even marriage recognition or the children's both again everything is interconnected so if somebody is a stateless person and their range of rights are being denied uh, and this is something which we may have to look at how this could further escalate into other tensions how do people become stateless it is said that it can be caused by number of factors it could be just the discrimination in the nationality law or the citizenship law as we can say based on the grounds of uh, racial religious caste gender discriminations it could be conflict and the gaps in the nationality laws as we know the nationality or citizenship are broadly uh, classified into two uh, interesting methods in which the citizenship is uh, given as we all know the sanguinis principle and uh, jus soli principle so jus sanguinis principle is something where through the descent blood ties or uh, you know that kind of a connection that one one tries to Uh, give rights to people jus soli is something where by virtue of being born in a particular country soil that you automatically get the rights sometimes that could be cracks or somebody could fall in the gaps in these kind of nationality laws or it could be state succession as a unified india became india and pakistan and pakistan became pakistan and bangladesh these kind of state successions or let's take the example of the disintegration of soviet union where number of commonwealth independent states emerged it is a context where people could lose out their nationality or citizenship or for the former yugoslavia turning into you know serbia bosnia croatia and so on so forth is an example of state succession sometimes it could be uh, not being documented properly lack of birth registration could also uh, be a reason for somebody becoming uh, facing the risk of uh, statelessness it also could be in the uh, situation of uh, you know displacement which could occur for variety of reasons today 
not just human rights violations, discriminations, or uh, protracted conflicts. Uh, we, we, even we could look at how environment and climate crisis is today going to compound this problem, and, and, and that could also be a reason for displacement, somebody uh, losing their uh, nationality. Now, if you look at the example of Syrian crisis, the, the risk of statelessness is increased by a combination of gender discrimination, because the Syrian nationality law uh, it does not allow a woman married to a foreigner to transfer the citizenship, coupled with the lack of civil documentation among the displaced population. These are all uh, some examples to look at. Now, what are the consequences of being stateless or statelessness? Without nationality, without citizenship, the stateless persons often do not have basic rights that the citizens could enjoy. The, state, the statelessness condition affects the social economic rights such as education, employment, social welfare, housing, healthcare, etc. As well as the civil and political rights including freedom of movement, freedom from arbitrary detention or even the political participation and decision making processes. When thousands and lakhs of people are stateless, the result is that the communities are alienated and marginalized. And the statelessness also could lead into further tensions, new conflicts and new forms of displacement. So what is the legal framework internationally available to address statelessness? The states, the nation states set the rules for acquisition, change and loss of nationality as part of the sovereign power. And uh, we, uh, as a part of the constitution, which is the legal political framework, uh, these provisions are there on which, on, on, on what are the discretions of the state, uh, which could uh, you know, provide nationality. And it also uh, could be either enhanced or limited by obligations by signing the treaties uh, and, and ratifying them when they become party to it, party to the international law. Sometimes even the customary international law or the general principles of international law could also uh, become applicable. Uh, just a, a glimpse at what is the global statistics on forced migration. So uh, globally, people who are uh, displaced are touching almost 80 million open numbers according to the UN statistics. Refugees alone are 26 million. Internal displaced persons, 45.7 million. The stateless people are ranging between 5.6 to 10 million. Asylum seekers around 4 to 4.2 million. So this is something the recent uh, conflicts at uh, very many uh, theaters, uh, whether it is uh, uh, the South Sudan, the Syria, Mali, uh, Central African Republic, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, has uh, Venezuela. This kind of you know uh, instability and uh, tensions have increased these forced migration numbers, which is worrisome. Now, coming back to uh, the international uh, legal instruments governing statelessness, let us note there are two important conventions. One, the convention relating to the status of stateless persons of 1954. The other one, convention on the reduction of statelessness adapted in 1961. These two are important international uh, instruments which are available. Uh, in a context, we all know that uh, in South Asia in general and India in particular, neither the Refugee Convention of 1951 nor the Statelessness Conventions are signed. So that becomes very challenging because uh, we are in a kind of uh, a legal vacuum. So 1954 Convention uh, uh, relating to stateless status of statelessness is a cornerstone uh, for the international protection regime for stateless people. It provides the definition of uh, the stateless person. It establishes the minimum standards of treatment uh, to be uh, meted out to the stateless persons. Uh, these include but not limited to the rights such as education, employment, health, housing, uh, and also uh, the right to people right to identity, travel documents, and other administrative assistance. Coming next to the obligations on the reduction of statelessness, 1961, it requires the state to establish and state safeguard the legislations to address statelessness occurring at birth, 
or the crisis which could occur later. It also sets out important safeguards to prevent statelessness due to loss or re renunciation of nationality or state succession. The 61 convention sets out the very limited situations in which states can deprive a person of his or her nationality, even if this would leave a person stateless. So how do you govern, how do you protect them? From here we can draw that how there is a regeneration in the last one, one and a half decade that we need to address this issue where the United Nations, in particular the UNHCR, has come up with an uh, interesting thing called I Belong campaign, where they are globally trying to engage with the nation states, academia, civil society and promote that how do we address statelessness and how do we ensure that the statelessness issue uh, could be uh, uh, you know, taken care uh, in, in one year period, starting from 2014 to 2024, they have ambitiously announced uh, that we will address statelessness issues and, uh, and, and, uh, and combat. But ironically, in countries like India, we are now uh, trying to trigger new uh, uh, forms of statelessness, new statelessness people in the form of uh, NRC and uh, CAA, Citizenship Amendment Act, which is something uh, you know, worrisome that, uh, you know, uh, whether we are trying to solve the problem in line with the United Nations proposal or are we trying to uh, not be concerned but uh, look into uh, our own uh, political tensions and wanting to trigger these things are something which we need to uh, uh, unpack and see. Well, coming back to what is nationality is a recognition which serves as a key to number of things which we referred, uh, the, the social uh, welfare, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is important. So therefore, people without citizenship, those who become stateless, become the most vulnerable groups. If you go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 itself, Article 15 deals with the inclusion of the rights of uh, nationality. UDHR as a whole was uh, motivated, as we all know, with the impulse to respond to the atrocities committed to the Second World War. Among them, there were mass denationalizations and huge population displacements and movements. Perhaps this was an impetus in which UDHR discussion uh, itself ensured that Article 15 uh, dealing with the right to nationality is uh, Addressed. We all know that how thousands of Jews who survived the Nazi perpetuated genocide fled their home countries, while millions of ethnic Germans were ex expelled from Eastern European states. Millions of Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and other minority population of Soviet Union either were forcefully expelled or fled for the safety is a context in which uh, we know uh, this is very much ingrained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where almost all the countries uh, part of the UN, we uh, endorse and, uh, and, and follow UDHR, which is a soft law, of course. As we said earlier, just to again quickly look at the causes of statelessness uh, could arise from the disintegration of nation states, or countries, or state succession, as in the case of Israel, uh, USSR, or Israel, uh, Yugoslavia. The political considerations could also dictate the way the citizenship laws are applied. As we referred earlier, the uh, uphill country Tamils in Sri Lanka, the Urdu speaking Biharis in Bangladesh, the Rohingyas uh, from Myanmar, some of the examples among others. An ethnic minority may be persecuted by being denied of their citizenship, or a group may live in the frontier areas and frequently cross uh, borders uh, who may get denied. The example could be the Bini uh, community in the Indo Pak. Uh, Orders. There are individuals who become stateless due to personal circumstances rather than persecution of a group to which they belong. The personal circumstances could be anything of travel, economic migration and other reasons. But yet at some point of time they could individually face the crisis. It could arise with legal differences between countries, people renouncing one nationality without acquiring another, or simply from failure to register uh, birth of a child. Now, as we said earlier, the new, aisle, the, the, the new category is from the environmental and uh, climate change related issues where small islands may be condemned by uh, changing climate and, and they could become entirely stateless when their countries, uh, the small island countries collapses. The examples are Maldives, uh, the Sundarban region uh, of uh, Indo-Bangladesh borders, 
the one or two can be taken. So, uh, as we said earlier, in the citizenship and statelessness continue. The citizenship is granted uh, by uh, two important uh, uh, methods, the jus soli and jus sanguinis principle, as we said earlier. The principle of international human rights obliged states to grant citizenship to individuals who have fallen through the cracks of jus soli and jus sanguinis. And within statelessness, we had seen the two categories of de jure statelessness and de facto statelessness. De jure meaning, uh, be, uh, meaning the legal uh, way of by law somebody is denied and de facto in practical sense. Uh, uh, well, when, if you can take the Rohingya uh, uh, as, a, as an example of uh, the de jure, we can take the West Pakistan refugees as a de facto example. Even though the union government had, uh, in a sense, recognized them as citizens, but in a practical sense, in the former Jammu and Kashmir state, they could not enjoy it. So they were, of course, not able to get access to education or employment or a range of other rights were denied to them. So they, they, they lived in a state of uh, limbo for quite some time. It's a case of de facto-ness. Today, we may look at uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, reverse labor migration, and, and, and we could see a number of people who may fall in the category of de facto statelessness because they are not able to access their basic rights. So uh, these things have to be seen. But by uh, UN agencies, uh, by international law, today the focus is more on de jure statelessness because by law in the legal system, somebody denied of it, they come under the category of international protection and thereby some of these international conventions would apply and, and there could be an engagement. That's how uh, the UNHCR uh, and other UN agencies uh, look at their focus today on uh, de jure uh, statelessness in, in a way to legally address. But we know uh, in, in, in a South Asian context or in India with our, our internal challenges we have, uh, sometimes the de facto statelessness are also very re relevant to uh, look at. Earlier, uh, the concern of what happened as the NRC process, the National Register of Citizens process in Assam, as a part of the Assam Accord of 1985 and, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, got into the picture and wanted to address uh, this issue in the last uh, a few years, three or four years, which is highly contentious, highly challenging, is a matter of concern. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to make a, a brief uh, a, a snapshot visit uh, to understand the dynamics uh, when the first list was announced with 40 lakh people being denied uh, citizenship or excluded uh, from the NRC list. And apparently it came down to uh, 19 lakh later. Uh, from, uh, from my, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, preliminary visit, a uh, snapshot visit and understanding the dynamic, it's a very complex issue. On one side, you have the local population, uh, the indigenous communities, uh, and, and, and an overwhelming consensus within the Assam that they needed to go for NRC to identify illegal migrations and things like that. Where they had kept, uh, you know, 24th March 1971 as a cutoff, and said that those who could have documents could, could, could get uh, their uh, citizenship recognized uh, by, uh, by due process of application. If not, then you know, they, they, if, if they have come in after 71, then they do not qualify. So this is one cutoff which has been kept and put an enormous pressure on the marginalized and vulnerable groups, labor class and others where they had to, uh, you know, uh, produce documents and, and, and go and prove their citizenship. This pressure was something uh, enormous and, and it triggered lots of anxiety. And even now uh, in the COVID context, this has compounded the problem. The second is the setting up of the foreigners tribunal in Assam, which would uh, uh, get the cases from the, the uh, border police and others and, and look at verified people and, and would decide whether they are Indian citizens or they are outsiders. The third is the de-voters. Uh, for quite some time, the election commission within Assam, I decided some people are uh, new citizens and uh, they, they are uh, eligible to become voters. They said there are some who are doubtful citizens and therefore they become doubtful voters. That's how that is another dynamics uh, in few lakhs which goes on. So put together, 
uh, after the announcement of the final list of uh, 19 lakh excluded now with covid coming in and and, and there there are uh, not much of any appeal process there are not much of any uh, foreigners tribunal uh, to look at the matter or for that matter there are no courts which are uh, going to you know, look into these cases so now what happens to them they they live a life of uh, being denied of uh, their nationality or citizenship is a big question mark. So this NRC in Assam now with the CAA being announced at the national level again a contentious issue where based on religion certain set of people can be counted as citizens, certain people are going to be excluded has triggered uh, the set of uh, panic. Some of the visuals during my uh, field visit uh, interacting with the uh, people uh, who are excluded. Now I'll uh, skip some of them and come to this important issue within the statelessness discourse. It is something very important to look at gender because gender issue is something very important in this statelessness and citizenship continuum. Uh, gender discrimination becomes a crucial factor which also perpetuates statelessness. There are many countries around the world which still do not have gender neutral citizenship law. In the worst cases, women lose their citizenship upon marriage to foreigners and are unable to pass on their citizenship to the children. I think this is a very important issue within this state business citizenship continuum. We have to look at this. There are, I think, around 28 countries identified in the last couple of years uh, when the UNHCR has mapped and they found that they have a gender discriminatory law, including our neighbor Nepal uh, had uh, this issue, has this issue of gender discrimination. If a Nepali woman marries a foreigner and the children, uh, you know, in case of their separation uh, and as a single mother, now she cannot transfer her uh, citizenship rights to her children. Uh, this was a similar case with uh, Jammu and Kashmir till recently, where their uh, 35A, uh, which dealt with uh, uh, their local law, which dealt with uh, uh, the permanent residency uh, denied this right. If a uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, citizen uh, woman marries a foreigner or a person from outside, then her right of uh, transfer of uh, citizenship rights was something very uh, you know, challenging. So this is where we see that how we could you know, globally address this issue of uh, uh, making uh, citizenship laws gender neutral is something very challenging. I think when CR and other UN agencies are uh, engaging uh, globally with many countries and I think that this issue is getting addressed now we're getting some good news that some countries are now adhering to gender neutrality and trying to ensure that they get uh, equal citizenship rights but it, it is uh, in practice uh, quite a bit of a challenge if you take the example of Swaziland uh, they adopted a constitution in 2005 which stipulated that the child born after the constitution came into force is a citizen uh, only if his or her father is a citizen. In Africa alone, nearly 20 countries still deny women the right to pass on the nationality to a foreign spouse. But there are, as I said earlier, the positive developments like Botswana uh, in the early 90s uh, identified this challenge uh, and they are trying to uh, plug this uh, with certain uh, amendments to their citizenship act. Uh, in terms vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the, the gender gaps. When you look at the International Human Rights uh, Conventions, the range of them, the report the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Similarly, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, International Covenant on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, the Covenant on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDA, uh, CRC, the Child Rights Convention, and so on and so forth. Uh, including the disability uh, rights. Uh, we see that there are, uh, you know, uh, provisions uh, which are available uh, to address it. These conventions, why I'm mentioning, because some of the countries like India, if we have not directly signed the Refugee Convention or Statelessness Convention, definitely these conventions which are there, which becomes relevant in a way to address in a, in a, uh, a neutral, non-partisan manner, how do we provide a citizenship or uh, the obligations of protecting people who are stateless, statelessness comes in. Now take a couple of examples. For example, uh, women and men should enjoy equal rights to transmit nationality is highlighted in the uh, SEDA law, Article 9. 
Similarly, the Child Rights Convention Articles 2 and 7 uh, do I mean, emphasize this point that there has to be uh, gender equality. There shall not be any discrimination on the grounds of race, ethnicity, religion, or disability in nationality law. Uh, this is highlighted very much in the 1961 Convention, Article 9. Uh, similarly, uh, in the uh, uh, Convention on Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination, Article 5 deals with it. Convention on the Rights of Person with a Disability, Article 18 deals with this, that there shall be no discrimination on any grounds. Similarly, the Child Rights Convention 217 is mentioned earlier to uh, mention this. The naturalization should be facilitated for stateless person is emphasized in Article 32 of the 54 Convention. So how do you uh, proceed with it? somebody who is then a nation state? Uh, how do you ensure that uh, one, that they are identified, map, there are real reasons found, and then how do you ensure that you uh, facilitate the naturalization process is one. If somebody is denied of the nationality in one country and then they flee as a stateless person to another country, uh, as in the case of uh, Rohingyas, becomes much more complex. How do you address the issue of uh, uh, voluntary repatriation? And then you need to uh, uh, recognize them in a due process. And, uh, and, and the naturalization facilitator is going to be a very uh, complex issue as well. But this is what is recommended in this 54th Convention. But many countries in South Asia have uh, not adhered to it. Whether that's triggering a new denial of citizenship citizenship rights and triggering your statelessness is something we need to look at. Or the migrant labors to be treated as a stateless population because for several years and decades if they have moved on and worked as migrant labor, today suddenly they, they feel, uh, they become invisible, they become uh, completely uh, marginalized in this whole process of new laws, uh, disaster management laws, the pandemic laws, the epidemic laws which have come in and created a huge panic where there are not much of anything on the transport or any of their uh, labor security or livelihood, nothing had been seen or treated and today they are in mass uh, in several millions uh, got uh, displaced into the reverse migration. So what happens to the plight? Can they uh, uh, retain their rights and, and, and cope up and do or is it going to uh, be a new status condition is something which we need to see as well, along with the existing invisible stateless population. Who governs the stateless people is very important. Uh, how do we uh, uh, bring them into the gambit of citizenship laws? Are they kept in perpetual statelessness by authorities to exploit their labor? What is called as the quote unquote in a disenfranchised labor, something which we have to see. And it's a matter of concern that the, the new stateless uh, people who are emerging due to either the pandemic or the new NRCCA uh, laws is also something to be challenging where it is going to enhance pressure on uh, the ongoing challenges uh, which, uh, uh, which come in the form of uh, uh, disenfranchised labor, uh, trafficking, particularly for women and children, uh, and other forms of exploitation which could be compounding the problem. We need to also look at how does this intersectionality of gender, caste, ethnicity, uh, religion operate uh, in, the, in the fault lines and, 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 and uh, uh, compound the problem. We need to look at how the international law, international legal framework uh, could work, uh, such as the I, I Belong campaign uh, by UNHCR as I referred earlier. Uh, how the academia could uh, play the role, how the civil society could play the role in understanding the issues revolving around statelessness, uh, ensuring that we would be able to uh, research and map the groups, identify the unique conditions and ensure that they could uh, be uh, made uh, inclusive, they could be counted as citizens, they could be recognized as uh, uh, you know, uh, the nationality, is a huge process. How do we map the stateless people and bring them under the advocacy and solution itself uh, becomes a uh, question. So you, uh, today, uh, you know, at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level, the statelessness as an issue has to be seen as a part of uh, the disaster, uh, the uh, forced migration uh, discourse 
and, uh, and the kind of complexity which is emerging, we need to see that we can address this issue by understanding it and further conducting research and mapping on this issue and form certain forums which can do sustained advocacy to address this issue. Uh, to, uh, to conclude, uh, at least we see uh, the refugee issue uh, is uh, very much uh, highlighted in the uh, uh, no, uh, uh, discourses and, and, and it is having certain visibility. But I think the statelessness, which is a related but yet a distinct issue, I think it's not, uh, you know, getting addressed. Uh, to share my own example, when I conducted, uh, uh, you know, a research on mapping the, uh, uh, the scope of, uh, uh, you know, uh, durable solutions for uh, Sri Lankan refugees, the refugees uh, who live in the southern part of India, uh, particularly in Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, as, a, as a part of the research, when we try to look at the durable solutions and other issues, when we found a, a large segment of them in the refugee camps who claimed that they were supposed to get their due rights as citizens as a part of uh, 1964. Indo Lanka Accord, otherwise called as the Sastri Bandaranaike Pact. They said that from 64 to 84, they had missed the opportunity to get repatriated to India to get the citizenship. When they got entangled into the civil war and then they came later in the mid 80s, they said that they were all treated as refugees and with this confusion they were put in the camps. When I recently uh, wanted to, uh, you know, conduct uh, a research on this, I know uh, MCRG has done uh, some research uh, uh, earlier as well. Uh, what I found, uh, my own experience of going down and seeking formal permission is that the, the government authorities, uh, the Department of uh, uh, you know, Rehabilitation and, and other uh, 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 departments which deal with this matter, then I went and formally gave them an application that I would like to visit the camps again and uh, they simply denied me the access by saying that there are no uh, stateless population, there are nobody who has got any Indian origin thing and everybody is a Sri I mean, uh, refugee uh, from Sri Lanka and they would all uh, you know, uh, be treated as uh, refugees uh, as of now and there is no need to go and uh, open a Pandora box and conduct. So that's where you know, I, I found that uh, the, uh, the conceptual understanding is lacking, there is a blur in uh, the thing of refugees and statelessness and therefore uh, the problem uh, is actually uh, continuing to linger even at some point of time the durable solutions are uh, achieved for children and refugees who are almost a one lakh population still a thousand plus in camps and another, another 30 35 thousand outside the camp but you may have these people uh, who are uh, initially uh, the, the labor migrants from India to Sri Lanka for almost a century plus contributed to the, the, uh, the labor uh, uh, the tea, in the tea gardens and, uh, and rubber estates in Sri Lanka. Uh, today, uh, because of the uh, new laws which came in Sri Lanka, first level denying them the uh, citizenship made, made them stateless, which lingered for a while then culminated into 1964 to 84. Accord of uh, you know uh, splitting the population. Some would be made citizens in Sri Lanka. Some would be made citizens in India. And in this endeavor, the residue population today are uh, mingled with refugees. And uh, and we need to you know. So I'm just sharing this as an example to say that how it is complex that it needs to be uh, addressed. It needs to be uh, you know uh, taken care. Uh, with the due process of uh, research, mapping, uh, and advocacy, these are some of the things which which have which have to be uh, uh, considered dealt with, and uh, and uh, further some of the questions which I uh, placed in the end uh, are something very important for us to look at how this issue is complex, how are we going to address. So I hope that this brief introduction on uh, some of the basics on definitions and, uh, and uh, some conceptual aspects on uh, uh, what is statelessness uh, is useful. I look forward to uh, interacting with you and uh, uh, wish you all the best of you. Thank you for this topic.